Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Are you interested in serving God? Having your life and everything that, that relates to your life being utilized by God for His purposes. See, we need to understand that once one receives salvation, they become a purchased instrument of the living God for His purposes. And if you didn't know that, then you did not hear a biblical presentation of the gospel. See, redemption involves, and that's what the gospel is, a plan, a revelation of God's redemption and offer to be redeemed. And when one is redeemed, as we see, for example, in the scriptures, what Paul writes to the Corinthians we become a purchased possession of the living God that we might glorify Him with our mortal bodies. That we become a receptacle, the Scripture says, a temple for the Holy Spirit to bring order into our life, into our situation, into the life of others. That is what we are called to be. And we are going to see much wisdom, much counsel, much truth in regard to being transformed and conformed to the will of God, the purposes of God in the chapter that we're going to study this evening. So with that said, take out your Bible once more and open it up to 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. God willing, we're going to look at all 18 verses in this chapter. And I didn't want to break it up because there's a flow to what Paul is saying, especially in this fourth chapter. And this fourth chapter is is rich. There is a wealth of information for us in order to learn how to walk with God, how to participate in his purposes, how to do what he has saved us to do. And therefore, this chapter is of the utmost importance. So let's begin. And it's vital that we pay attention to exactly what Paul is revealing, understanding his intentions because he writes not from his own perspective, from rather from the perspective of God. All of this obviously was inspired by the Spirit of God for the purposes of God, for the glory of God. And that's why he writes 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse verse 1. He says, on account of this. Now, what is this? Well, you're going to discover what this is as we go through this entire fourth chapter. This has to do with the ministry that we've been called to. What God commands us demands us to do and if we don't understand that this instruction is just that an obligation unto him we don't understand who we belong to what we have become in messiah so he writes here on account of this having this ministry so he realized he's speaking to believers now he's writing to this congregation at corinth but What he says in this chapter is relevant. It is essential for all believers. If you want to grow, you want to mature, you want to be more pleasing to God, you want to experience him in your life, then you are going to take seriously this chapter. You're going to study it. 
You're going to study it again. You're going to listen over and over to, to this teaching because it is so relevant. It is so informing for our walk with the living God to experience him and how to be an instrument so that others can know God's presence, his power, his provision in their life. So Paul writes, on account of this, having this ministry, just as we have received mercy. Now, this word for receiving mercy, and it's very hard to translate it literally in the Greek because it's in the passive. And what this tells us is that something brought about mercy. It just didn't happen, and we didn't receive it by anything that we did. It was because of another factor, and that factor is, of course, the work of Messiah and the grace that, that he offers. When we receive that, we become a recipient of his mercy. But we see so frequently in the Scripture how mercy is foundational for beginning the work of God in a person's life. So he says, just as, and that's the word, pathos, just as we have received mercy, we do not uh, lose heart, we do not despair, we do not grow, grow uh, weary. Now, what he's speaking about is this, receiving God's mercy, it has an effect in us. And that mercy causes us not to become easily discouraged, to become uh, worn out in doing that which is good. But the mercy of God energizes us. It gives us a passion for the work of God. And we're going to see in this chapter, it's all about doing his work. That's what ministry is. So he says, on account of this, for this purpose, in other words, we have this ministry. Just as we've received mercy, we do not uh, lose heart. We do not become dispersed. We do not, we do not become worn out in the things of God. That's his, his, his message. But, and notice this, but there's a change. But, he says, we reject and the word here, I might use the word in English, disavow. It is a rejection that comes with a, a strong, strong affirmation. This is not part of, of my life. This is not who I am. So I reject, I disavow. I have nothing any longer to do with these things. And realize it's those things, and we'll talk about what they are in a moment. It's those things that are going to work in our life in an adverse way that is going to cause us to grow wary, to become discouraged, and to lose heart. But when we are committed, and here's the key, when we are committed to doing ministry, doing the will of God, the work of God, it is going to bring about a dynamic change in our life. When we are going to be energize we are going to have a sense of purpose a sense of meaning we're not going to experience uh, discouragement we're not going to have emotional things that that paralyze us and hinder us but we're going to be pressing forward with excitement for the service of God and that's why he says look again verse 2 but disemboweling, rejecting the hidden things of shame. Now, what hidden things are you talking about? Things that uh, people do that they don't want anyone to know about them. So the hidden things are things that if people would know that we're doing those things, they would be a cause for our personal shame. So we want to keep them covered, hidden, Camouflage. This is not what a true believer does. What he's saying here is that these things we reject. Notice very carefully, 
but, and we could say, but rather in contrast to, to this, what do we do? We disavow, we reject the hidden things of shame, not walking in, and this is a word for, for something that's not upfront, something that is not clear or, or easily discerned. What he's talking about here is something that is, is hidden, but the word would be more in line with that which is crafty. Someone thinks hard for the purpose of hiding these things. And, and Paul's saying, this is not how we are. We do not have a, a hidden agenda, a hidden behavior, things that we do that we don't want anyone else to know. We live a very transparent life. So he says, in contrast to those hidden things of shame, he writes, but rather, he says, we are not walking in craftiness nor adulterating, and this means perverting the word of God. Now, it's so significant that Paul, when he talks about life, a lifestyle, he always turns quickly to Scripture, to the Word of God. The context here that we see right off the bat in verse 1 is doing ministry. Now, you should be able to take out a piece of paper and write down things that you are doing that, that relates to doing ministry. If you're not, you're saying to God, God, I'm not interested in you. I don't want your provision in my life. I don't want your blessings in my life. I really aren't, I am not interested in you. If you are about doing ministry, blessing others, helping others, being a positive influence for the things of God in others' life, then you're saying the exact opposite. So how do you answer that question? Do you have things that, that you can write down that relate to ministry that you are doing. He says, we are not walking in craftiness in, in the adulterating of, of the word of God, but for the manifestation of truth. And he says here, which commends ourselves to the conscience of, of men before God. What he's saying is this, we are able to commend, and this is a word of presentation. This is a word of transparency. We are living and behaving in such a way that no matter who we come in contact with, their conscience, and remember I put a big emphasis upon the human conscience. It is a, a gift that God has placed within every human being. That, that convicts them. Now, of course, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit works in a more powerful way. But, but all people have a conscience that teaches them to a certain degree what is right and what is wrong. Not to a full degree, but, but partially. And what he's saying here is that we, he's speaking about how he conducts his life and others who are serving with him, he says, we are able to commend ourselves before the conscience, before all men. And they can see that there's something godly, something righteous, something that is proper on how we're, we're living. So the transparent things of his life bears witness to others that he is living for God, that he is about being a blessing, being a help to God others and he says that this is true before God God testifies as well before God he agrees with this this evaluation look now to verse 3 but but if also is hidden and this is a word which comes from something that has been hidden in the past now and will continue. And the reason why these things are not uh, uh, acknowledged, not seen as valuable, 
not seen as significant. He says, but if it is hidden, what's hidden? Our gospel. What does he mean by our gospel? The gospel of Messiah that we are proclaiming. The death, burial, and resurrection, why he died, that he was buried, that he descended, but being fully dead, he rose, he conquered death, which means he had victory over sin, the consequence of sin. That is the gospel that Paul's referring to when he says our gospel. So read all he says, but if also is hidden our gospel. It's to those that are perishing. That's who it's been hidden to. Those who are not going to ever respond. Why? Because they have no interest in the things of God. They're pursuing what motivates them, what drives them, are the things of what we talked about earlier, shame. Now, here's what we need to see. When it talks about shame, it's talking about those things according to the standards of God. God says such behavior, such deeds, they are shameful before me. He rejects them. And not only rejects them, he will bring judgment upon them and what those actions bring about the outcome. He is going to judge. And his judgment ultimately is a consuming one where these things are going to be destroyed and that's what he's talking about the people if you are living in shame those shameful things they are not just going to perish but you will too it's going to be an utter destruction so when we read here he says if if our gospel is is being hidden then it's hidden to the ones who are perishing verse 4 in whom God, the God of this age, now he's speaking here about another spiritual principle that I have mentioned many, many times, especially when we were studying in the book of Exodus and the life of Pharaoh. But this is a principle that is so foundational, so vital that we learn. Notice what he says, verse, verse 4. In whom God. Now, God of this age, he has blinded. So in whom the God of this age has blinded. What has he blinded? The thoughts of the ones who are unbelieving. They are, are lacking faith. And the phrase here is really they are against faith, meaning they are against the truth. Remember what we talked about. This word faithlessness or the term here unfaithful, not believing, unbelievers, it is because they are willfully rejecting truth. Truth comes to them even though they have a conscience that says yes to this. This is right. And that's why I've experienced this. And talking to others, I know that this is a, a common, common to humanity common experience that when they begin to hear truth their conscience tells them this is for you you need to respond they fall under conviction now if they respond to that they are brought closer to God God willing they will continue to draw closer until they become believers and are saved saved by God's grace He's drawing them to himself. But if they reject that, if they say no, that rejection hardens their heart. And that's exactly what it says here. Here it uses the description that God blinds. But, but here's what we need to understand. It is not God going and saying, oh, I'm looking at this one. I, I choose because I'm sovereign to blind this one. And this one over here, well, I'm sovereign. I can enlighten this one. We don't see that being taught in the scripture. Poor theology, it teaches that, but not the word of God. What we find is this. When the conscience bears witness, this is true. And a person says no to that. 
that darkens their, their perspective. It, it brings about a hardening of the heart. It brings about a spiritual blindness. Blindness. That's what he's saying. So in whom the God of this age, he has blind, blinded their, their thoughts, the thoughts of the unbelievers in order that it would not that they would not have illumination they would not be illuminated to the light of the gospel of the glory of messiah who is the image of god now we don't have enough time to unpack that last statement but but i would would counsel you with with great great seriousness and trying to to give you an incentive to really study what it says here. When it speaks about Messiah, notice the context, because they said no. God, as a response to their rejection, then stopping the work of their conscience in their life, God of this age blinds their thoughts, the thoughts of who? The unbelievers for them not to be enlightened concerning the, the light of the gospel. Notice how the gospel is mentioned, the gospel of glory of Messiah. It is a, a message that manifests glory, and the, the source of that glory is Messiah. What he has done and who he is. Who he is. So these two things, who he is? He's God. The God who became human flesh and laid down his life so that we could have eternal life to be saved. This manifests God's glory. And when someone says, no, I, I'm not, I, I, I hear what the conscience is saying within me, but I reject that. They are rejecting they are rejecting God's illumination. And instead of saying yes and having more and more illumination given to them every time they say yes to God, agree with their conscience, when they say no, they are increasing the darkness so they do not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Messiah. And look at this last part of, of verse 4. And speaking about Yeshua, it says, who is the image of God. And, and this word for image, icon, is a very, very important word. One that, that you need to know what, what relevance and what significance this word icon is. It speaks of a perfect representation that meets the objective of, of the one. And what we find here is that this icon, Messiah, he's the image of God. He was never made. There was never a time that he did not exist. But he is the perfect representation of substance, of very deity, so that he's God. And this is what the scripture is boldly sharing, verse 5. For not ourselves we, we preach. He says it's not ourselves that we are proclaiming, but Messiah Yeshua, the Lord, but ourselves. And the reason why it says but, it's in contrast to him. He's making a great distinction. And that's why the grammar is so important. He's making a great distinction between the Lord, Messiah Yeshua, and himself and others who he's serving with, who he ministers with. He says, look again, verse, verse 5, for not ourselves we preach, but, but Messiah Yeshua, the Lord. And after speaking about Yeshua, he says, but ourselves, your servants. He's saying, in light of knowing him, Yeshua, Understanding what he has done for, for us. This has caused us willfully, with great desire, to become your servants. 
So if we are embracing this truth as we should, we should not only be able to write down the things that we do that are, that are ministry, but also the ones that we are serving, that we become their servants. That's what Paul is saying. And furthermore, look now, he, he writes, all of this is on account of, the verse ends, verse 5, on account of Yeshua. Knowing what he's done, how he has blessed me, how he has saved me, how he's redeemed me, and with what he redeemed me with, his blood. I now become committed. I become, Paul saying, your servants on account of him. Verse 6. Because God, and this is the God, the one who, and some Bibles like the King James, and most of the time I, I like the King James because it tends to be literal. But here the King James took some, some liberties that they ought not. Because I believe both the King James and the New King James says, who commanded. It's not the word commanded. It's the one who has spoken. Now obviously, what God says comes with an authority. It's a command, but it simply says, let's look at the entire verse, verse, verse 6. That God... The one who has spoken out of darkness, and he has shined light. So God spoke, and this goes all the way back. It's a reference to creation. And the creation account speaks about the authority of God to bring order, to bring purpose, to bring meaning, and to bring a future. Before God began to bring light and those changes in, in, into creation, the earth, what does it say? Empty, void, formless, it couldn't produce. But when God began to speak, and this is what it says here, right? The one who spoke, when he began to speak out of darkness for the shining of light, which he shined in our hearts, to the, to the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Messiah Yeshua. Now, that is a, a lot of words as we conclude verse, verse 6. But what he says here, it all began with the word of God. Realize that, that your life, what you're going to do, what you're going to become, what rewards, what promises you're going to receive, the blessings in the kingdom of God, it all begins with the Word of God. And that's why, if you're wise, you're going to be committed to the Scripture. Not just doing what it says, but learning what it says. Many times people want to do, but they don't understand. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes prayer. And therefore, he writes, God, the one who spoke out of darkness... And he, he shined light. Who has shined in our hearts for the light of knowledge. So he's given us knowledge. This illumination is so that we can know truth. And that knowledge brings about the glory of God. And it does so in the face of Messiah Yeshua. Now, in the face can be understood as before in his presence, that he's there overseeing, he's there supplying that light, but it can also mean in the face, face, we all know the, the birkat hakonim, the Aaronic benediction, which says, the Lord make his face shine upon you. Twice we see that expression. The Lord shine his face, make his face shine upon you. And that is an idiom for blessing. So when it says here, all of this is being done, and let me translate literally, it says, in the face of Messiah Yeshua. The implication is, as he is there witnessing those things, he is going to be blessing. So when we do those things that reflect the illumination 
of the Word of God from the truth of God. We are going to be doing ministry, which is going to bring about the blessing of Messiah in our lives. Verse 7. But we have, what great news, we have this treasure. This treasure in an earthen vessel. Now, what's he talking about? We are the workmanship of God. We are the creation of God. And through faith, as an outcome of being redeemed, we become an earthen vessel, which is a treasure. A treasure that reveals and releases the blessings of the kingdom of God. The blessings from God into others' lives. So he writes here, but, but we have, not everyone, we, believers only, we have this treasure, an earthen vessel, in order that the surpassing power shall be of God and not from ourselves. So now, and I love this word, and this word is going to appear at least two additional times in this chapter. And it's the word that talks about a fulfillment, a want, a desire, and going beyond, exceedingly beyond. So let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, I'm short money, and I, and I go to someone, I say, I really need a, a, a financial blessing. Would you give me a hundred dollars? This word would, would relate to one who does not give just that amount, a hundred dollars, but would give five hundred, a thousand dollars, going exceedingly beyond the expectation or the need or the request. And that's what he says here. That, that we have this treasure in an earthly vessel in order that the surpassing, the surpassing power shall be of God and not from ourselves. Verse 8. Now, why is he giving this, this exceedingly power? Well, in order that we can suffer much. It's very important that we see how the scripture moves along. Now, not too long ago, I was, was listening to a message of someone in preparing for this study, and the person was speaking on this verse. And when he talked about that surpassing power, he gave it in context to achieving prosperity taking hold of the things of this world and redeeming them for the children of God and was all about living in the life of luxury. Now, I can assure you that people would like hearing that message. I can tell you someone who didn't, and that's God. The Spirit of God was not in agreement with what he's saying. He took that totally out of context. This surpassing power is for what purpose? Well, move on to the next verse and see what Paul's going to talk about. See, he never dealt with anything in continuation within the passage. Notice what he says in verse 8. In all troubles. Now, he's talking about life of luxury, having the very best. We be the king's kids, so we should live as the king's kids. The king's kids know the very best. They eat the best. They wear the best. They experience the best. But this is not what the scripture tells us. That is what he talks about earlier, which is adulterating the word of God. He says, we don't do that. As he says earlier, we don't peddle the word of God, meaning we don't make it a business. What is he saying? Context tells us. Look again at verse 8. In all trouble, but not being crushed. 
He says, we experience all sorts of trouble, but we are not crushed. Sometimes he goes on and says, being, being perplexed, being confused, but he says, but not, not being of despair. So we are experiencing trouble as we walk with God in this world. We are going to experience trouble. We might find ourselves at times being confused, perplexed about what we are experiencing. But he says this trouble does not crush us, nor does this, this confusion. It does not bring about discouragement or despair. Now, I like what he's saying. What does this tell us? We persevere. We not only persevere, but with God's help, this, this power that he spoke of earlier, we are going to not only persevere and endure, but we're going to overcome the things of this world. And where are we going to overcome them? In, in the kingdom of God. Notice how he continues on, verse 9. Not only are, are we individuals in all sorts of trouble, but he says being persecuted, but not abandoned. So he says, we're going to be persecuted. This is what the believer experiences. As we walk in faith in this world, we're going to experience persecution. Now, we all know Hebrews chapter 11, that, that great chapter about faith. Read the last part of it, where it talks about faithful ones being sold in two, burnt, having all types of torture placed upon them. These individuals who were in the hall of fame of faith, doesn't say, and they lived in great prosperity and with a luxurious life, experiencing the final thing, final, fi finest things of this world. That's not what the scripture says. And, and let me share with you, those who misteach give a false presentation of the word of God. Remember what we talked about earlier? They have a conscience. And they say, no, the spirit of God tells us this, this isn't right. This is not truth. This is not what the word of God says. I mean, we don't have to have a PhD to see after God speaks about power, he calls us to suffer. He says, look again, verse, verse 9, being persecuted once again. There's a cause that brings about this persecution. What is that? Faithfulness. Being persecuted but not abandoned. God's not going to leave us nor forsake us. He says, being cast down but not uh, destroyed, not being destroyed, verse 10. Always, and I want to underline that, always, he says, the, the death of our Lord Yeshua. Now, he's talking about trouble. He's talking about being confused. He's talking about being persecuted. All these things. And then he moves into the best example of why we're receiving those things. What happened to, to Messiah? What happened to Yeshua? He died upon that tree. Why? He spoke truth. He did truth. He was faithful. How faithful? Perfectly faithful. And what did they do? The world nailed him to a tree, tortured him, beat him previously, shamed him, mocked him. And who's he? The Son of God. How dare we think that we should be in the life of luxury? So he says, always, as I said, underline that, always the death of our Lord Yeshua. In the body, we carry, meaning this, in our existence, as we go about day after day, Event after event, we carry, we remember, we bear the death 
of Messiah. We remember that, that he suffered. So don't be surprised when you suffer. He was hated. Don't be surprised when, when you are hated. That's what he's talking about here when he says we carry the death of our Lord Yeshua in the body. Why? We'll remember something. In order that also the life of Yeshua in our body we manifest. And it literally says that it be manifested, meaning there's a cause. As we walk in a recognition of Messiah who died for me, who suffered for me. That, that memory, that commitment and understanding of what he did for me is going to encourage me, empower me, and steer me, direct me to do those things that I may suffer as well, will suffer experience persecution but i won't be abandoned i won't be crushed i will be overcomers because i'm going to and this is what it says here because the life of yeshua it should be manifested that's what it says in our bodies verse verse 11 for he says a different word but means the same thing always for always we, who are the we? He, he defines that. For always we, the ones living, living for death. What does that mean? It's very similar to what Messiah taught when he says, if you want to follow after me, pick up your cross and come. We are living, but we're living for death, meaning we're ready to die we're going to make the decisions do the things that is going to cause the world to want to rise up and kill us so when you suffer for your faith don't don't be surprised don't be faithless and say why is this happening to me you're learning why it's happening because this glorifies god you say my suffering for him glorifies him yes it does but realize what a great reward you're going to have. And when you see the outcome from eternity because of what you endured here for him, there's going to be no complaining. There is just going to be great and exceedingly gratitude for him that he counted you worthy to suffer in his behalf. So look again, verse 11. For always we, the ones living for death, it says, being, being delivered over through Yeshua or on account of Yeshua. We are handed over, delivered over on account of Yeshua. Why? In order that also the life of Messiah, here's the third time or second time he said that, should be manifested in our, our mortal fleshly bodies. In this fleshly body of, of death is what it's saying here. So we realize something. We have to make a proper evaluation. I'm in this body. And, and how much time do I have in this body? One scripture says 70, perhaps if you're strong, 80 years. Now today, people are living a little bit longer than that, but I can tell you. If, if you reach 80, you're, you're in decline. And you're declining rather quickly. You, you don't feel when you're 82 the way you did when you're 81. And, and oftentimes, if you see people when they pass 80, change their appearance. Things can change rapidly. They're in a, a very big fall in, in decay. That's just simply how it is. Happens to all of us. So we are running out of time. So don't be so stupid to want to have everything in this temporal life. I only go around once, so I want all the gusto, all the things I can get, because tomorrow I may die. Foolishness. You may die tomorrow. What then? A faithless person says, well, that's, that's the end. It is not. 
It is the beginning of eternity. And you do not, you do not want to be unprepared for that. And that's why Paul's sharing what he's sharing in this great chapter. When he says, for we, the ones living, living why? For death. That, that we are being delivered on account of Yeshua in order that also the life of Yeshua being manifested in our, our bodies, this mortal body of, of our flesh. So that, verse 12, so that on one hand, death is, is being worked out, being done in us. But on the other hand, it is life for you. Now, notice, as Paul writes, he's always thinking about those that he's ministering to. And he's saying here, so that when we have the right mindset and we're doing the right things, we are living for death. We know we're going to die. And we're going to be persecuted. And the world is going to want to bring about death. And by the way, we're naturally, because we're human beings, we are in the process of decay. He's going to come to this in a moment. So let's not emphasize that which is decaying. When you, and hear this principle, when you are all about investing in this world, this life, you are investing in that which is being destroyed. Now, if we had money and we were going to invest in a company, would you want to invest in a company that's decaying, that is moving towards its conclusion, its finish, that is going to be no more? You would not. You would want to invest in one that's moving up, that has a future, a glorious future, a good future, a long future. Well, if you invest in the kingdom of God and you're part of that kingdom, you have a glorious eternal future. So you are deceived if it's all about this world. Do not be one that mourns your death. Now, the death of others whom you love might grieve you, and they should. But realize your death, it's a release. It's a transition into the glorious presence of God. And that's why he says, look again, verse, verse 12. So that on one hand, uh, death is being worked out in us, but on the other hand, life unto you. Verse 13. For we having the same spirit of faith, according to that which has been written down. Notice faith goes with the truth of God, the scripture. For we have the same spirit of faith, according to that which is written down. So Paul says, I have, have believed, therefore I have spoken. He says what he has believed. Also we believe, therefore also we have spoken. He's saying, I am sharing with you what I've believed. And we, as a ministry team, we are sharing what we believe. That's what we, we speak. No hypocrisy. That's why Messiah was so, so upset with the leadership, with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, hypocrites, but not these men. Verse, verse 14. Knowing that, and what a great passage knowing that the one who raised the Lord Yeshua, also we, therefore, will, will rise of Yeshua. By our relationship with him, our covenantal relationship with Messiah, the same one who raised him, we are going to be raised of Yeshua, by Yeshua, with Yeshua, meaning the same kingdom life. This is what we're going to experience. And notice, twice we have a reference to what? Resurrection. Resurrection, what should come into your mind? This is why we began in John chapter 11. Because the resurrection is, is associated. What did Yeshua say to Martha? He says, I am, what an important phrase, I am the resurrection and the life. If, if you don't experience resurrection, you're not going to experience the real life of God. 
If you think now is life, you've been deceived. You've believed a lie. No, resurrection gives life a kingdom life experience. So he says, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Yeshua, also us, on account of, we might say, of Yeshua, he, he raises, that we're going to be raised. And not only that, presented with you, meaning we're all in it together. Paul says, I'm going to be resurrected because of my faith in Yeshua, and I'm going to be presented along with you. Here's the key, what he's saying. As I have ministered to this one, when they come before God for that judgment of rewards, Paul's going to be right there. You're going to be right there with the one who you minister to. I am going to be right there with the ones that I've ministered to. Because, read Hebrews chapter 11, in order that there's a sharing of these, these kingdom rewards. So he says, and also presented with you, verse 15. For all things on account of you, he's saying, I'm making these decisions on account of you, in order that the grace should, in its word, for abound. In order that the grace should abound, he says, through more. More people is how most understand this, but, but the grace should abound and should do so more and more. And what is going to be the production of more and more grace? Here's what he says. The thanksgiving should abound in the glory of God, to the glory of God. So grace abounds, and this brings about more glory being given to God through thanksgiving. Now, spiritual maturity, when you are growing spiritually, you are going to have more and more of a sense of gratitude for God. It's just going to be the natural outcome. You're going to see his workmanship, his provision, his leadership, his presence in your circumstances, and you're going to just naturally, it's a spiritual outcome, you're going to have more and more gratitude for God. That's how you check your spiritual maturity. Am I growing in Messiah? Am I more grateful? Do I walk around with a profound sense of gratitude to God for the privilege of serving Him? Seeing his presence, what he's up to in my life and in my circumstances. Verse, verse 16. Therefore, and remember, we saw, if we go back to verse 1, we read in verse 1, on account of this, we have this ministry. Just as we've received mercy, we do not lose heart, we do not grow weary, we do not faint. Well, he says as he concludes this chapter, he goes back to that same word. Now let's go to verse 16 again. Therefore, not losing heart, but, and he's talking about this inner change, this new man, this, this inner man, he says. Therefore, not losing heart, but if also, the, the outer man is decaying, and it is. We could say not if, but since. Since the outer man is decaying, this outer man is what you see. Right now, I am in the process of decay. I'm getting older. My body's wearing out. I'm not as fast, not as strong. Don't hear as well. Glasses have to change. All these things are evidence that says to me, I'm approaching death. I'm coming to the end of this existence. That's okay. I don't, I don't mind that at all. It's simply the outcome of life, a physical life. But what motivates me is the kingdom life. And that's what he's going to emphasize before we close. He says, therefore... We do not lose heart. We do not become faint-hearted. We do not despair, grow weary. But since also 
The outer, our outer man is decaying, but, and here's a, a very important uh, uh, particle of speech, the word but, in contrast to. We could translate it but rather. But rather, the inner one, that inner man, is being renewed. How? Day and day, meaning day after day. We're in this process of a spiritual renewal. The inner man, not that outer one. We're getting older, we're decaying, we're wearing out, but the inner man is experiencing a kingdom renewal. And that word renewal is related to the kingdom. Verse 17. For, and this is what we need to see, a very important word in verse 17. For, this is word for the moment. Don't focus in on the the moment, meaning this age. Why? Notice what he says. For the moment is what? In this life, momentarily, we have, he says, our affliction. It's the word thalipsis, tribulation. So momentarily, we have our, he says, light tribulation now why does he say light tribulation very simple compared to the wrath of god what we are experiencing for righteousness for ministry purposes for the truth of god they are light and they're only momentary terror they're only for a short while so he writes for the moment our light affliction but then he uses this word, remember, surpassing exceedingly, wanting a hundred, getting a thousand. He says, far exceedingly, for exceedingly is the eternal weight of substance. That word can mean the depth, meaning of, if you say that person's deep, they have a lot to them. And it's saying the eternal depth of what? Of glory. It's talking about how, yes, momentarily in this age, we have our light tribulation that we go through. But all of that, remember, momentarily, it's temporal. But what do we have? We have exceedingly for exceeding, it's the word twice, surpassing for the surpassing eternal depth of glory is being worked out in us. And here again, being worked out, meaning it's in the passive. Hopefully you understand what that implies. It implies that it's that temporary tribulation, light tribulation, comparatively speaking, that we're going through. It is what is producing here this, this eternal very meaningful, of substance, highly significant glory that we're going to have. Verse 18, the last verse. Now, I know we're going a little bit long tonight, but sometimes we go short, only 40 minutes. This week, a little bit longer. Verse 18. He says, we do not, and the word here, many Bibles say, look, that's fine, but realize there's going to be two words used here. The word blepo and the word for scoping something, scopus. So we have the word scope, which means to look at something carefully, to look intently, to look with great significance uh, at something. And what does he say? He says, we are not looking intently at the things seen. What can you see? You can see money. You can see uh, the luxurious things, luxurious things of, of this world. You can see uh, uh, all those things with your eyes. And he says, we're not paying much attention to those things. We don't give them much, much importance in our life. We're not gazing upon the things that are seen, but he says, the things that are not seen. Why? What's he referring to? The kingdom promises. He says, we gaze not on the things that are seen, we don't give them significance, but rather on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary. They're here, 
but they're not enduring. In fact, if you look at the book of Revelation, in one hour, they're all going to be destroyed. None of the things that the world puts significance on from a worldly perspective is going to make it into the kingdom of God, not according to the book of Revelation. He's going to destroy them in a moment. So the things which are seen, they are temporary. But the things which are not seen, they are eternal. And remember, that word eternal is an adjective that describes the kingdom of God. Paul. And this fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians gives us much wisdom and insight and knowledge and truth for living a life that is going to have eternal significance. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank <laughs> you.